Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, open them to Acts 27. Acts 27. I keep saying it every week, but we're getting close. Been in Acts for a while, and uh, again, I just think it's been a really good uh, read for us. So hopefully you're able to lock in. Uh, the KU game was early, so you didn't get to bed late if you're watching the game. Uh, and the national championships tomorrow. K-State fans, the national championship is if, okay. <laughs> and a mass exodus begins now. All right. Now, we're, uh, we're glad that you're with us this morning. We have been working our way through Acts. We've been spending quite a bit of time on this. It's been a great study for us as we've been walking through all the things that have been going on in our culture, society, and everything that we've been dealing with. Everything that we've been dealing with personally, we've been dealing with as a country, we've been dealing with as a church, not just ours, but the big C church across all bounds. There's just been a lot of things. And as we work through Acts and we see the devotedness and the sincerity and the way that the church moved forward in such tough times, it's been a good picture for us to stay resilient. And so if I told you that I knew the most famous person in the world, I just made a bold statement. We're having a conversation. I'm letting you know I know the most famous person in the entire world. You'd probably have a few questions, like you'd want to know who it is first, uh, and then you probably have some follow-up questions to that. I'm going to let you little, on a little secret. It's, it's Jesus. He's the most famous person that's ever lived. Uh, cultures uh, that have been reached with the gospel in the middle of nowhere know the name of Jesus. And so the next question you might ask is, how long have you known him? Because if you're going to ask the question, or if you're, I'm going to tell you I know this person, and I don't know him, like I've never, well, I've never actually met him. Well, again, I don't know him then. Well, I've known him for a year or two. You don't really know him then. Like, there's no depth of relationship then. Uh, but if I told you I've known him since the fourth grade, and there's been a relationship there that's been growing ever since then, uh, there's, then there's a little track record. There's some, there's some time there where God has actually had a chance to have a relationship. We've worked. Uh, he's worked on me. He's developed me. And then the other question, if I really actually know them, like when you know somebody, whenever I meet somebody, and they're like, I know this person. Like, I'm friends with them. But for one of the first questions I ask is, what are they really like? I want to know what they're actually like behind the scenes. There's a lot of famous people who are really well known, and then you find out behind the scenes, they're, they're pretty much a jerk. They put on a, a face for everybody. Uh, the one that is most prominent that I can think of, and I hope I'm not destroying your boyhood dreams here, guys. But I stood in line outside of Kauffman Stadium at the time. It was not even Kauffman Stadium yet. And I was probably about 15 or 16 years old, maybe 14, and I'm waiting for them to come. You used to be able to wait outside. There's a tunnel, and they would walk out the tunnel, and if you had something you wanted them to autograph, you could hand it to them, and they would sign your thing or whatever else, so they'd talk to you. And it's kind of a cool way to just see a player up close. And I watched George Brett rip an 8-year-old kid for trying to get a baseball signed by him. So again, sorry if George Brett's your guy, but he's kind of a jerk. <laughs> Who does that to an 8-year-old? See, here's the thing, though, as we talk through this and we're walking through the truth of not just Acts, but all of Scripture as a whole. Remember, this is 66 books telling one story. This is a 66 set uh, of pedals on a tandem bike, all pedaling in the same direction. It's not randomness that's been thrown together. We see a true and whole picture of who God is and who Christ is. Obviously, the Trinity as we believe in it and who they are and how they've shown themselves over time as one. And it's not what he was like. I've asked the question to youth. If you've hung out with youth very much, you're like, what was Jesus like? What do you think Jesus was like? Most of them will start, well, I think he had a beard. He was probably fairly tall. Uh, why tall? Because he was God's son. God's not going to make his son short. Um, <laughs> that's, that was one of the answers that I got. Well, he's going to have long hair. He's going to wear this, that, and whatever else. And the picture that we need to have here, and the thing that I'm going to kind of draw in through Acts 27 is I wrestle with, how, how do we talk about Acts 27? It's a storm. And so as we're talking about it, how do I know that Christ is who he says he is? How do I know that God is faithful? Well, Hebrews 13.8 tells us that he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Jesus, whom we read in the gospel, says he is meek in heart in Matthew 11. His yoke is light. Come to me who needs rest and who is burdened. And this is, the, where, this is the direction we're going to go today in this passage. It's going to be totally different. Uh, it's not going to be the three points in a, in a conclusion uh, type of sermon that it normally is. We're just going to wrestle and we're going to process and we're going to uh, go through this uh, section here. 
And I really think that a lot of times it's missed because, again, it's, oh, it's just a storm. We're just learning about what happened in a storm. And then Paul says, calm down, guys. It's going to be okay. They shipwreck. No big deal. But there's a lot of depth here. So we're going to read Acts 27, 1 through 38, and then we'll dive in together. So Acts 27, starting in verse 1. If you don't have your Bibles, it will be on the screen for you. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramitium, which it was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in the Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty at Sinatus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon. Salmon. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there and on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew greatly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous tempestuous, uh, wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along, running under the lee of a small island called Cotta. We managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground uh, on the statists, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo, And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take, take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, and we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea... About midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for, and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, they took bread, giving thanks to God in the presence of all he broke it, and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Let's pray. 
God, we pray this morning again, as always, um, that it would be your word that we would listen to. Spirit, I pray that you would work mightily in this room and that uh, whatever it is that uh, those in this room are, are needing to hear, that they would hear it, that, that it would not be the words of my own mouth and that I would add nothing to this other than what it is that you would have me say. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we're getting to the point here where he's actually on his trip. Uh, you can see the trip on the slide that I think I have on the screen for you. And he's taking this trip, and this is the, this is the simpler version. There's a much more detailed version we could put up there. Uh, but I don't want you staring at it for the next half hour. So, But this is the trip that he was going to take. This is the trip that they're on. Paul is finally on his way to Rome after all of the times that he had to have these hearings and being like talk to these people and have all this stuff that was done. He's finally actually on his way to Rome, which is an amazing thing if you think about it because he's really, really wanting to get to Rome. He wants to meet the people of the church and he wants to greet those who are part of the church in Rome. Why is there a church in Rome? Because of the diaspora. Because of people like Paul and Paul himself who literally ran off the Christians away from Jerusalem and tried to murder them and kill them, and they all dispersed out to different places all over the known world this time, all the way even to Rome. And so you have a group of people who have started a church in Rome basically because of the despair that took place because of Paul's treacherous actions and his acts of terrorism against the church. And now, by God's providence, he is now going to them, and yes, he is going to be on trial, yes, he's going to speak to Caesar, But he's also going to have the time to also speak to those of the church as well. I mean, those who were driven from their homes by this man are now going to hear the word of God preached to them by this man. This is going to be an amazing thing to think about because some of these people's own family members would have suffered under Paul and people of the like. So imagine sitting in a church and here comes this guy and now he's going to tell you more about Christ and he's going to preach to you and teach you and minister to you, and yet you know him as that. Through the evils of men, God worked his eternal plan for the church and the world. Through the evilness of Paul and the like, he moved the church forward and and planted a church in Rome to take this place so that it could spread the gospel to a group of people who were extremely pagan and didn't know Christ. And as Joseph will say, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. And we've talked a lot about the sovereignty and and the the providence of God, but we can't lose that. I keep talking about it because it's important, because a lot of times I think we're just kind of, I think we just feel like we're a leaf in the wind, and wherever we land, we just happen to land, and that God will kind of figure it out as it goes, or or he's just kind of of figuring it out as it goes. Remember, he didn't even wait to figure out what he was going to do to save us and redeem us. The plan was already in place, even as the fruit was being eaten. We're talking about a God who has all of this in his mind, his hands, and knows all of these things to be true. So it was his plan to do this, and yet because of these evil acts of men, God knows it's going to happen and uses those directly for his purposes. And Luke does an amazing job here. This is, if you read the whole thing, and I know we read all of this and we were, ta- we were kind of reading through, this doesn't read smoothly. In fact, there's a very significant thing that if you're a person who does a lot of sailing, and you're a person who's really into that kind of thing, you're like, He could have said this in a much better way. But Paul, or sorry, but Luke, Luke is on the boat. He's physically there. He's seeing it in the first person. And he's a doctor. He's explaining it all. You're going to get all of it. And then we went here. And then this happened. And a wind blew. And we went there. And we crashed here. And this is what happened. And he's given the entire explanation of what took place. There's actually a guy in the 1800s who was part of the Royal Navy. And he was a master in the Royal Navy. And so he decided when he was stationed in Malta, he's like, I'm going to figure out exactly what Luke was talking about here and see if he was actually accurate. And so he lays out the entire thing and goes through all the process of figuring out all the data that they would have needed to have to sail and make this trip. And he comes to the conclusion of two things. Luke is ridiculously accurate and has so many uh, exact points of what he talks about. And two, he had to have been a landlubber. Because of the way that he explained it. But what it did is it gave accuracy. And that's what I love. We continue to point to the accuracy and the truth of what the Bible talks about. Years later, people are continuously trying to figure out, well, was it really that way? And continuously it's proven, yes, it was. And so he's 
giving this detailed account of everything that happens and how everything is going to take place and all the cities that are easily pronounceable that they end up landing on. <laughs> and what we get here is a strong picture of the situation that these men are in. That's the point. It's to get a real picture. If he said, man, there was a real bad storm out there and we were a little bit worried, he'd be like, ah, I've been in this storm. I live in Kansas. It's 70 mile an hour winds every day. I know what they're dealing with here. I've been in a bad storm before. Have you been in 14 days of being exhausted because of the beating that you're taking from the winds and the waves? Have you been tossed about? Have, these, these boats don't tack. Okay? They're not able to actually tack and use the wind. It's essentially wherever the wind is blowing, that is where we're going. And, and this is the storm that they're dealing with. It is pounding them. It is overwhelming them. It is becoming such a scary thing that they're literally like, this boat is not even good enough anymore. Let's just see if we can get in the little boat and make it to the shore, possibly. We've, we can't imagine what they're going through here and what the picture of this is. And we've never probably, I'm going to guess, most of us, unless you've been in the Navy and you've been out in the middle of a massive storm, I'll, I'll concede that. But most of us don't know what this was like and the turmoil and the angst and the absolute despair I mean he literally says we gave up hope that we would be saved this is Luke talking I love Luke's genuineness here as well he's not but we believed in the Lord so we were going to make it Luke is at this point genuinely like I don't think we're going to make this thing and so it's important that we see the honesty and the accuracy here as well but this is where we see the steadfastness of Paul this is where we see the steadfastness of Paul, knowing the promise God had made despite what he was facing. Here's the promise, Paul. Paul saw the storm that was going on, and he had a choice. Is this going to overwhelm me, or am I going to trust that God said this, and this will happen? I mean, he calls out to them in verse 22, and yes, the angel came to him and spoke to him. He calls out in, in verse 22, which is kind of funny, right after he gets an I told you so in there. I told you not to take off, but I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you. He calls out to them to assure them that nothing will happen because God has promised this. And I know you're looking at this, but we need to trust this, the promise of God. I mean, these men couldn't see the sky. Did you catch that? They couldn't see the sky. They couldn't see the uh, water around them at night. They couldn't see anything other than the turmoil and the wind and everything else that was whipping around them. They couldn't even see the sky. Have you, we've been through winters like that, or you go through a week where it just won't stop raining and the sun finally comes out and your whole soul goes, thank you. 14 days of this. 14 days of their life hanging in the balance as it seemed to them. They were running out of food, they couldn't see land, they couldn't see the sky, they couldn't see anything around them, and they were scared out of their minds. But God's promise was that Paul would make it to Rome and stand before Caesar. Even before this angel stands before him and says, you're going to make it, Paul. He was given that promise by God earlier in Acts where he says, you're going to go to Rome and you're going to teach and preach in my name. Here's something we don't always look at, though. Here's something we don't always see. Notice it says, not one life will be taken because everyone who is on this boat, Paul, all their lives have been given over and will make it with you. Common grace is a beautiful thing that I don't think we give enough credit to. Common grace is the thing that God spared all of their lives. He was only promising that Paul would make it. He didn't even promise Luke would make it. So technically, out of all the 270 some people that are on the ship, one is technically supposed to make it. And yet God's common grace, the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous alike, he will save these men as well. And so it's amazing the fact that they get to the point where they're almost in complete despair and they're going to get in this side boat. And after everything that has happened, Paul says, don't do it. If you stay on the boat, you will make it. And they listen and they cut the lifeboat away and they trust that God will do what he has told Paul that he will do. It's funny because they say that they all prayed. These guys aren't Christians yet. Maybe some of them became Christians. I don't know how you make it through this and go, yeah, Jesus isn't real. God's not real. Maybe some of them became Christians, but right now they're not. But they're praying to whomever they want to pray to 
to try and save them because of what is going on around them. But they listen to this guy who says, the God that I worship and the God who has called me and the God who has promised says, this is what will happen. And they believed him. And I don't want this to sound cheesy because it can. I mean, I can easily do the cheesy move of, and God can help you through the storms in your life. But that's not the point I want to get across. It is kind of the point that it's going to get across, but not in the cheesy way. It's in the resilient, I trust God, I see where he comes from, I hear his word, and I know it's true. And in the midst of the horrific storm and fear, Paul knew God's promise. Believer, we know in our heads facts about God. I got all the facts in my head about God. I can recite verses. I can tell you all the stuff that you need to know. I got all the facts. I can tell you anything about the fact that, oh, yeah, he did promise this and this and this and this and this. But do we truly believe that God's promises and are true and will be true? That's the thing. I can, most people will actually even agree, yeah, I see how all the Old, Old Testament promises came true. I can see that. Okay, do you see that all his promises will come true? I don't know. I can't see the sky. I don't see land. I don't know. If they always have been and God never changes, his promises will always be true. Do we put our faith in the fact that a God of all eternity cares for the birds of the air and the flowers of the field and you matter infinitely more to him he didn't die for the birds of the air. He didn't die for the flowers of the field. He died to redeem people back unto himself. So when it says that he has a care for them and takes care of all their needs, do you believe that? I mean, I've known Christ since the fourth grade. I, well, I, I thought I knew Christ in the second grade when I got scared by a crazy movie that they decided in the 70s was a good idea. A Thief in the Night, Don't Show It to Children. And don't watch it in general. It's, it's, you know, Christian movies are a little weird sometimes anyway. This was like 1970s weird. So, but I was kind of scared into this thing. And thankfully, again, I've said this before, my parents were very astute to that. And I started asking questions. So in the fourth grade, I really went and had these conversations with my pastor. And he walked me through it. And, and at that point, I realized the depth of my sin. It was more of the, the, the previous time before that was I'm scared of hell. And I don't want that to happen to me that happened in the movie. And now it was, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And guess what? There is one for my sin. But how well do I know him? I mean, for a lot of my life, pretty well. I mean, I went to church. I did all the things. Uh, I wasn't doing bad, st bad stuff. I, I was trying to live a good life. I mean, I, I read the Bible. I believed everything about it. I was a believer. But when you really get to the depths of life, when the storms of life come, it becomes more apparent to us who Christ really is. I mean, when he's been nearest to me in my difficult times, it becomes very obvious that when trials come, and they will, I've seen his faithfulness. I have seen deeper heartache. And in the midst of that deep heartache, and some of you guys can really resonate with this, I thought in the depths of this heartache, I can't go any deeper. And then something else happens that takes that heartache deeper. See, people don't understand about God, about the Bible, about his word, about his promises, about hope, about all those things that we believe are true. That when we're here, well, God's supposed to get us out of there. But then there's another level. How do you trust him in that? How do you trust him when all these things are going on and it seems like another piece of heartache comes along? What's he doing? I don't have all the answers. So don't be like, he's going to give us the ultimate answer here. I do want to tell you, though, that in the midst of that, there is hope and peace for the believer in Christ. If Christ came as a conquering Superman who felt nothing, nothing could bother him, nothing could hurt him, he didn't have to deal with any hardships. He didn't have to deal with anything. He just destroyed everyone in his path, did what he wanted to. He was impervious to everything that could possibly happen and did nothing else other than just smash everybody out of his way that didn't believe in him. It would be really hard to trust him in the trials because all I would feel is that he's going to crush me too. 
What do we say to people who try to tell us something when going through a trial, right? Whenever I'm going through a trial and somebody's like, well, you know what I would do? <laughs> That's the worst start to your sentence. But a lot of times someone who has never been through that situation tries to offer some depth of advice. Instead of, I love you, I care about you, I'm here for you, let me know how I can walk with you. Instead of that answer, it's more of, here's some advice for you. And whenever I've gone through something that somebody else has never gone through before, the first thing that pops into my head is, you don't know what's going on. How are you going to give me any advice? How are you going to care for me? How are you going to whatever? Because you don't know anything about this. And the thing is, is that we kind of have this, uh, this thought or opinion that if they don't know or they haven't experienced that they can't possibly sympathize with us. But here's the thing. We have a Savior who does. We have a Savior who knows. This week I was listening to uh, Sinclair Ferguson, who I love to listen to him. He's uh, just his voice in general. He has one of those good talking voices, not like mine. I listen to the recordings on YouTube. I'm like, Ugh. But I think we spend so much time defending Christ's divinity that we forget about Christ's humanity. We think about those things and we kind of def defend Christ's divinity. Of course he's Jesus. Of course he's God's own son. But we don't ultimately look at the fact that he's also fully human as he's here on earth. Again, we think of him as some sort of superman who has so much divine power that nothing could possibly get to him. Nothing's going to get to him. He's superman. How could he know? His life had to be easy and perfect. But instead, we see in the scriptures and we know the truth that Jesus was fully man and fully God. His full manness means that he felt pain, he felt loss, he felt burden, he felt hurt. He had friends and family die. He had people betray him. He felt bumps and bruises and each and every stake and thorn that was driven into him, he felt every one of them. There's a heresy out there that's been there for a long time that Jesus was God, removed himself out of the body so he didn't feel those things and then came back into the body. That is dumb. That's not the point. Why would God send him to be there for a little bit and then remove him out and then put him back in? He felt every one of them. He sweat drops of blood. The language used there when you read that passage of scripture is a violent act of turmoil within him. He wept. He was in such pain in the garden that an angel was sent to minister to him. I'm trying to give you the picture of he knows. There's a early church father that said there's two things he wants to do when he gets to heaven. He wants to see his Jesus and just stand in the presence of the Lord. And he wants to thank the angel that ministered to Jesus that night. I never thought about that. Jesus knows. I mean, who is Christ really? I like to think about, people will give the, uh, all the time, and I always cringe. Every time. And my wife's like, you've got to work on your face language. <laughs> because somebody says, uh, ooh, that's not good. But you hear all the time, I like to think about Jesus like, and out rolls the heresy. I like to think of him like this. And he kind of fits into this narrative, and he's like this. So dangerous. Number one, that's dangerous because now I've created an image of who God is or how powerful he is or who Christ is. And number two, that's never going to sustain me in a storm, ever. Because my greatest thoughts would crumble under the weight of that pressure. If Hebrews 13, 8 is right, and he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And if he tells us in Matthew that he is gentle, meek, and humble in heart, then that is who he has been. That is who he is, and that is who he always will be. Your wrestling, your striving, your struggle, your sorrow, your pain, this is Christ. When we say Christ loves us, we have no clue what the depths of that actually means. We try to quantify it and explain it. Man, he loves you so much. I mean, how do you explain the love of an infinite God? 
when all that we know of as love is a fallen picture of what love is. I really love my wife and my kids. I do. I would, do, I would die for them. I mean, that's, I don't know if there's a greater love than just saying, uh, kill me, spare them. I, I love them. But even that love is fallen and flawed. I mean, he took on our sin upon his shoulders. Peace for our restlessness. That's the thing I hear most from people who don't know Christ, is the restlessness within. Like, I just can't get this. I just don't get it. Why is there something within me that says there's something else? I don't have what I feel like I should have. But the peace of God for our restlessness and bring us under rest in God. That's what Christ said. Come to me who are weary and burdened and laden. I will give you rest. I will give you a deep abiding peace. Christ invited the weak, the broken, the burdened. He invited them in. And here's the thing. God has always made promises to Israel and to those who would follow Christ as Lord. Every promise made in the Old Testament finds its yes in Christ. Every one. That's why he is the Messiah. Remember I gave you the example last week. It was a, it was a low shelf picture, but the idea that everything looks exactly like the Messiah in the Old Testament looks exactly like Jesus. They are the same picture. It is a mirror image of each other. They have that picture right in front of them. Every promise in the Old Testament came true and is yes in Jesus. Every promise that was made to believers in Christ by God is still yes in him. Where does my salvation land? In Christ. Who will say this is mine on the day that I go to see the Lord? Christ. All of his promises for my future and everything else. And again, I don't mean a future of health, wealth, and prosperity. My, my future might be a car ride home that ends in a wreck that I die in. I'm in front of the Lord at that point. He holds me fast. And that promise is faithful. His ultimate promise to deal with our restlessness and our lostness in Genesis 3, which was by far the hardest promise to fulfill and to come through, not for God, but in our, our thinking about this. And he was faithful through every step. This is the longest promise. This starts before we even think about time, really, the promise happened. And it was the longest promise it took to fulfill. And he was faithful every step of the way to bring Christ to that point. That is how Paul can yell out in the midst of the storm to take heart. Said all that to come back around to this. How can Paul yell that out? Because it's grounded in the fact that he knows that who God is. Paul didn't just believe in God. He believed God. There's a big difference. There's a lot of people that will be standing in the wrong line after this life is over. Thinking that I believed in God. Why am I not in the line going to heaven? Why is my name being read out of the other books and sent for eternity to hell? Because they believed in God. They never believed God. Paul believed he will do what he said. He believed that in life, death, present, future, etc., I will be with you. That was his promise. I will be with you to the end of the age in Matthew. So if Paul died, Christ is Lord. If Paul lived, Christ is Lord. If the ship made it safely, Christ is Lord. If the ship wrecks, Christ is Lord. If they faced horrific storms longer than the 14 days, Christ is Lord. Get the pattern? The world's peace is relative and fleeting because it depends on circumstances. If you ride the wave of circumstances, you're going to be living a life that's constantly like this. Because circumstances go up and down and are fleeting. But God's peace is absolute and eternal because it's grounded in his eternal grace. From all eternity I've held this. Trust me. Worry reveals that we are mastered by our circumstances rather than his word and promise. I needed to hear that this week. I'm not preaching that at you. I'm preaching that at myself. I have a lot of worries at times. And worry reveals that we are mastered by our circumstances rather than his word and promise.
Let me finish with this last little bit. Anyone can trust God in the light, but it takes something else to trust him in the darkness, and that's faith. Believer, be encouraged this morning. Do not live in such a way that you believe the info, but not truly believe in God. You don't believe what God has said. Evil, back, bad, dark, storm will all come. It's going to come. We know that's going to come. You might be in the middle of it right now. But that does not mean that God is not still working. Even in my death as a believer, God's ultimate promise that I am his will hold me. I love the, great, I love the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And this week I was, I was listening to a whole bunch of hymns this week, uh, of different styles and genres and things like that. But the greatest thy faithfulness just struck me again this week heavily because it says strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. That's the point here. They had strength for the day because of a bright hope for tomorrow. That's our hope that we cling to. So if you're a believer in here, that's what we cling to. And if you're an unbeliever in here, this is why we have hope. This is why we worship. That's why I walk in here and I don't care what song it is. I mean, I just love the simplicity of Jesus loves me, this I know. Like, I love it. And I'm not judging anybody. I'm just telling you, it took me a long time to get to the point where I wasn't like, oh, this isn't the song I want to sing today. But instead, it's just, that's true, Lord. That's true about you. I want to worship you. This is why we want to tell you about Christ. This is the hope. This is the peace. This is the thing. That even in the midst of the worst trials and struggles and turmoil, that I still have hope because I know the one who holds all things. I want to tell you about Christ because that thing that you're wrestling with, that thing that you're angst about, that thing that you can't find peace in, it's found in him. This isn't a sales pitch. This is something we know because we've experienced it. Someone who truly is found in Christ will not miss every bad thing in this world. But they will live in such a way that it's obvious that someone else holds their future. The faith in my God is not of my own doing either. He has grown me deeper and deeper and deeper. It is not of myself. That de depth of faith wells up from somewhere else because I could not manifest it in me. But the un unbeliever, this is a promise that God has given as well. And I have worries and struggles. I'm not trying to get across that I don't. I already told you I needed those words that worry reveals that we are mastered by our circumstances rather than this word and promise more than anybody else probably. But here's the thing. I ultimately know and truly believe that no matter what, Christ is Lord. Is he Lord of your life though? If you don't know him, the response is for today not for waiting down the road or waiting down the line. The day is the day of salvation. If you can't stand and say, no matter what comes, trials may happen, Christ is Lord, then today's the day. Let's talk about that today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, I pray that this morning, um, again, your word was heard, um, that it, the truth was from you. Uh, Lord, anybody who is wrestling with this, as believers, we struggle, God. We know the answers and we believe in you. We believe you, God. We trust you, but some days it's just hard because we're fallen people. But if there's someone in here who doesn't know, Lord, I pray that they would come to the realization that no matter what type of fighting they do or what kind of things that they battle against, that there actually is a peace and a hope in you. It's not a maybe, sort of, kind of hope it is. It's an absolute resounding yes in you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. And if you would stand with us as we close with Because He Lives. God sent His Son They called Him Jesus He came
as he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, and life is Because he lives, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still, the calm assurance. Child can face uncertain days because Christ lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I. gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone. All right, so I get to make the first of a couple announcements. So I'm Brandon Emichek. I am co-chairing the uh, lead pastor search committee. And before I give the update, if I could, if you're serving on the committee, could you please stand for a second so everybody can see who you are? All right, thanks, guys. Um, so we've been meeting every two weeks, uh, as Dale had shared with you guys. And we've kind of achieved uh, one of the first milestones. So we have the uh, job description approved. Uh, we've amended it. It's through the elder board. And we are also had the uh, church doctrine, which we've got to answer some questions on the EFCA's website so we can post. That's also been completed and approved by the elder board. So the next steps for us over the next three weeks is to actually get the job posting out. We're going to put the posting out with a couple seminaries. We're also going to post it on the EFCA site. And then Todd had a couple other sites that we're going to post it on. To kind of set expectations as we're going through, we laid the whole process out on the board. And the earliest that we would have um, a potential lead pastor visit the church is probably late September as we're working through this. As we're going to give time for them to put applications in. And then we've got a survey we're going to send out so we can get to know them get to understand um, where they stand doctrinally and make sure that it lines up before we start to bring them into the church. So we'll continue to give updates as we're going through. I'll expect we'll give one in May um, at the next business meeting, and we'll, we'll continue to give them as we go and as we hit milestones. But we really wanted to let you guys know where we were at. If you have any questions, any of those that were standing, myself, Marlon, Dale, Todd, um, feel free to talk to any of us um, as you're going through. The 
biggest thing that we're asking for right now is if you could just pray for us for endurance and for unity within um, the group. There's a lot of work that has to be done yet in going through resumes. And then once we get these surveys back, reading through these surveys and processing to try and identify um, the potential candidates that we would want to sit down and have a long interview with. Um, and then eventually identify the man that God's already identified for our church. So, thank you. Thank you, Brandon, for sharing that. Um, one small thing to start with is that recently um, the elders voted to give $1,500 to the International um, Christian Enterprise and 1500 to GSG Global um, Signet Group, who is one of our mission boards, for help for the... Y- y- Ukraine um, crisis that's going on. So we just want to share to you that we are um, helping with that. Um, that. Then I just wanted to bring up a, a little bit, just to share kind of where some things are at right now. Um, back last June, when the announcement was made that um, our, our co-lead pastor, Patrick, was going to be re- 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 resigning, one of the things that the elders told Todd and his family and everyone here, our, our, our church family, is that we would help Todd and kind of keep an eye on things for him so that he wasn't over overworked. The worst thing that could happen is we, we put so much pressure on him that he, he couldn't stand up um, on, under things. He's been doing a great job. And the elders have been constantly talking to him we, we meet I mean, every time we, we talk uh, as a, a board, we go over what the sermons are coming up, who's going to be preaching, days that Todd's not. And these last several months, um, I, I've been meeting with them every other week, every three weeks. The other guys have been meeting with them too, just to keep a, a, a hand and understanding to know where he's at with things. One of the recent meetings we had, I walked in his office and said, hey, so how, how, how's it going? He said, I am worn out. A lot of things going on. I'm just t- 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 tired. We talked about things. Things that c- came up in the conversation were that the, the, the um, gospel b- baseball c- 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 camp coming up in, um, in, in July and his, his, his sabbatical. Let, let me start with his, his sabbatical because what, what was supposed to happen is last summer he was supposed to have six weeks off for, for a, a sabbatical. But when, once he knew that Patrick was going to be um, leaving, he agreed, or he, he told us, that he would wait for a, a year to, to have that. But it's been getting hard now. Um, really, we could, he could sure use a break. And he, we were talking about this article, and he said, you know, the, currently the way it would be is I would have to do it after the baseball um, camp that we're having, which would be in like the middle of July and then six weeks. But the problem with that is, you know, that's getting close to when the kids go back to school. His wife has a job at a school. She, she, she teaches. She'd be going back before the kids. It would just be a stressful time. And he was concerned that is this stressful time really the best time for sabbatical? I don't know. But that's what, where it's sitting right, right now. Then we talked about this, the, 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 the baseball camp as well. And he said, you know, there are things that I, I really have to do. To, to get to things happen, I just don't have time. And I, I'm just, I'm concerned. Some things that should be happening, we're not sure if, we, if the, the, the pastor who we've, we want to have is going to be available for various reasons. We don't know. But there's a lot of work, and I'm just worn out. And I said, if, if you could just say to me, when, when would you have, when's the best time for your sabbatical? He said, you know, the best time would be like around the beginning of, of June, and then take six weeks. But I don't want... That's that baseball, unless we can pass it off to somebody else, I can't go into that sabbatical with this thought in mind that I'm coming back to something really big that I've got to just jump back into. I certainly understood that. We talked about, is there anyone else that you see that could step in for you instead? And we just really couldn't come up with anybody. But we agreed, let's just give it some thought and talk about it. And that was fine. Walked away, just thankful that God told me to, that, that day, go in and talk, talk, talk with Todd. It, it's, it's an important thing, and I'm thankful for that. The, the, the next meeting we had, we had a, an elder board meeting almost two weeks ago, 
And it wasn't even on, on our agenda, but it was on my heart. We needed to talk. And I said, hey, Todd, can, can I mention what you and I talked about? And he said, that's fine. And so we shared about the baseball camp and about, about his sabbatical. And <clears throat> um, in, in the end, we made some really hard de 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 decisions. Being on the elder board isn't always just the easiest thing. Sometimes you've got to make hard decisions. And a hard decision that we, we made when we couldn't come up with a person to take Todd's place for the baseball camp was to postpone that from doing it this summer until n n n n n next summer instead, if, if God would, would, would have that. Um, and then the other thing we talked about was his sabbatical. Let's go ahead and, and let him take it um, at the beginning of June. And we're still in talks now, whether the beginning of June or even a couple weeks before that. Not because he's on death's door, and I don't want you to think that, because he's not. But I just, I just want you to know that we believed in our heart, with all our hearts, if we didn't take action, then it could get worse and worse. And, and our biggest, he is our friend, we love him as who he is, we love his, his family, his wife, and his three kids, and we don't want anything to, to, to happen to him. And so we're trying to help watch over and and just make sure that he'll be okay. And he is. Again, please don't go to him saying, oh, Todd, I'm so sorry for you. Because it isn't that, that, that way yet. Thank God it's not. But the, the, the hard decisions have, have been made that he's, he's going to, to take the sabbatical coming up um, at the beginning of the summer. And we were going to postpone on that baseball camp. Even though we didn't want to. An, a, a gospel opportunity is great. We'd love to have those. But when we don't have a, a, um, a lead pastor... This isn't just the right time for that. So we had to make that decision, and we have. And so I just wanted to share that. And I would ask that you would just be in, in prayer for us as the, the, the elder board as we think through how to do about eight weeks um, of, of Sundays without him being here because we, we definitely want to make sure that in the end, when he comes back, he won't preach that first Sunday back as well. We want to give him some kind of ease in like we all like to do with our, our jobs He's back in. Don't face that mountain when we come back. So I would just appreciate your, your prayers for him and just wanted to share information because we want to be upfront with you. And want to. it's hard to know when to share that. You need to do it when everybody's here. And at the end, when we've heard a, a, a great message, that we, that maybe we think that's about the best time. So let me close this in, in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for the message that we heard today. You are a faithful God. You are the only God. You are our only hope. We can have faith in you and trust you and believe in you. I do also ask, as Todd was saying, Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't put their faith in you, that you would please speak to their hearts and minds and draw them to you, the God who can save them, the only hope they have. You and I pray, amen. Thank you very much.